Hi James, thanks for um, you know agreeing to talk to me today. It's brilliant. Nice to see you. How's everything over there in London? Um, yeah, locked down at the moment, but things will get better. I am indeed James Bowringer. I'm a trained as a urologist. I've been doing uh, vaginoplasties and other feminizing surgery for trans patients for the last 21 years now. Um, I work at Parkside Hospital, which is a small private hospital in Wimbledon, uh, where I work alongside Tina Rashid. We have a specialist nurse, Laura Mita, and uh, some uh, admin support there. Uh, elsewhere in the UK, there's a team at uh, Imperial College, Charing Cross Hospital, uh, consisting of uh, uh, Tina Rashid and Roland Morley. And in Hove, in, uh, just outside Brighton, there is Phil Thomas, who's been doing it nearly as long as I have. Uh, he started, I think, nine months later, but uh, we'll, we'll, let, we'll let him off. Um, and uh, his two colleagues, Charles, uh, Charles Coker and Tim Lana. Um, and that, at the moment, is it for British-based vaginoplasty and feminizing genitoplasty surgeons. Brilliant. Okay, as of November 2020. Brilliant. Yeah, as of November 2020. Because <laughs> things are shifting so much at the moment. Brilliant. Okay, so fantastic. So I think, what, what, obviously, the idea behind this interview, this little bit of film, is to is to really guide patients through um, through the process. So we want to, um, you know, obviously I'm, I'm a gender clinician. I work in Wales um, for the Welsh Gender Service. And so one of part of my role is to talk to, to people um, who are interested in, in genital surgery and, and uh, describe a little bit about what's involved. And I think what's missing at the moment is, is, that, is that kind of in-depth, um, understanding about surgery. I can I can talk about it, but so I'm limited as to how much information I'm able to describe. And I thought it would be just really lovely to hear to hear hear it from you know the horse's mouth, so to speak. So um, that's the idea of this discussion. And um, I suppose the first thing to say is that there's always this run up to surgery, isn't there? So there are some preparatory things that patients need to be thinking of in the run up to um, surgery. Yeah, I mean, you, you won't get to clinic without a referral, so some of these things may have been addressed. At the moment, there's an absolute cut-off of 31 for BMI, and if you're above that, um, you won't get an operation until you've lost sufficient weight to be underneath that. Yeah. Uh, the reason for this is fairly simple. It, it, the risk of complications, once you go above a BMI, goes up exponentially and so you're into a much higher risk zone much work, greater chance of poor outcome and of significant complications best avoided um, so we do ask patients to lose weight if you have other health conditions it's largely depending on what they are um, if it's as good as it can get we will normally put you through surgery. There are one or two patients for whom surgery is contraindicated because they just will not get through a large operation such as this safely. But the majority of patients with modern anaesthetics can get through an operation. Uh, we may send some patients away to improve, for example, if their uh, hypertension is poorly controlled or if their, if their angina is poorly controlled or if their asthma is not right, we may send them off to get something done or to have some further investigations to improve the safety of your procedure. But the majority of patients eventually, if they're within the weight guidance, can, can have an operation. Yeah, brilliant. And of course, you know, we're all very used to, uh, in, in general practice, um, to managing those things and making sure that blood pressure is under control, well controlled. Because of course, uh, most people will have had some hormone therapy before they have surgery. And of course, it's a similar, it goes along similar guidance to that, isn't it? I mean, certain surgery is actually one of the riskiest things you can undergo. And the, the, the key is to, to reduce the risk to the absolute minimum for any individual patient and then go with that. Yes, always better to get it at the right time rather than rush in and, and regress it. Absolutely, that. absolutely. And then the, there's a physical examination, some of which has already taken place by the time you come in and sit down. The fact that you can walk into the clinic room without uh, being short of breath is a good start. As far as physical examination thereafter is concerned, we've, I'm afraid to say, and this is what the patients don't particularly like, is we have to focus on the bit we're going to operate on. 
You're, you're we need to for. see what skin is available um, and therefore what techniques might be usable so that we can talk to the patient about the operation they individually are going to have. The vast majority of patients do have enough skin for a skin tube vaginoplasty. Um, if patients have been circumcised, it is likely that they will require some scrotal skin to be added to the penile skin to make a, a usable vagina of satisfactory depth. Because scrotal skin is hairy and it, because it's going to go right at the top of the vagina um, and therefore can't be reached for removal of hair after an operation, it's very much better if that's removed beforehand. I think you touched us briefly. We're going to talk about the actual surgery uh, itself. And there's obviously there are three types of surgery that you're able to offer at the moment um, in, in the NHS. I wonder before we get stuck into those three types, whether we might touch on some of the other things that are going on elsewhere. No, I, I, think, I think bowel segment vaginoplasty, it does have a place, but it is second choice. And to be, to be honest, I, I think that a bowel segment vagina has a functional life of probably 15 to 20 years, at the end of which some of them, most of them will have to be removed. I mean, Phil Thomas and I have been doing this longest of the people working in Britain at the moment, and both of us have removed several old sigmoid vaginoplasties and other vaginoplasties made of gut. It's one of the concerns I have. Over, over the younger patients who have uh, puberty arrest, who are having bowel segment vaginoplasties, particularly in Holland, it's fine having a bowel segment vaginoplasty at the age of 20, but if it survives 20 years and then you repeat and repeat and repeat, you could be on your third or fourth bowel vagina by the time you get to 70 or 80. Right, okay. And, and are you able to speak a little bit about peritoneum? Because it is something that I get asked quite a lot. The peritoneal thing, it, it's not a new idea, actually. Um, this, this was a, an operation originally devised for the very rare girls who are born without a vagina, uh, meaning girls with a vulva and a uterus who have a missing vagina called Rokitansky syndrome. And there were various techniques to give these girls a vagina. And a Russian surgeon in about 1920, I think, called Davidov, came up with the idea of creating a peritoneal tube between the skin of the perineum and the vulva and the, and the uterus. And this technique came in and was used and it's been used an awful lot. My only comment is that for those patients, gynecologists I know who are treating Davidoff patients are no longer using peritoneum, they're using skin tubes. Um, it seems to me, therefore, that they've come to the conclusion that the skin tubes are working better than the, than, than the peritoneum does. Right. I've only ever seen one long-term peritoneal vagina, and I have to say the result was very good, except for externally where she had some issues, which is why she came to see me. But yeah, I mean, that's my comment, really. The peritoneal vagina, it, it may be the greatest thing since sliced bread, but the gynecologists have largely given up on it. And... This makes me think that it's probably not going to be quite as good as, as it originally came, came out as being. Uh, I think for most patients, it's best to go with what's good now. And there's no reason to think that they're not going to have another 20 or 30 years before they die of equally good vagina from it. So it's a tried and tested thing. It works. The problem with, with, with doing things like uh, you know, perishing vaginas and so on is actually you will compromise going back to a skin tube later because you'll have removed some of that skin or used it to do something else with, and you can't then make it into a vagina later. So you've burnt your boats a bit if you go down that line. If it works, great. But if it doesn't... If it doesn't, the skin's gone. Yeah. It's gone. A good point, a good point. Okay, so we're going to talk about the what is, what is, you know, what, what is done, um, and we're going to use Elliot, the brilliant Elliot's going to um, edit this all for us so that there's some pictures, some illustrations that I believe were, were, were done by one of your talented nurses, is that right? Yeah, this is, this is, this is Laura, who, um, right. uh, who uh, works as our specialist nurse. And um, a while ago, she uh, said she was thinking of buying herself a pen for her iPad. And I said, well, I've got a pencil, I never use it. And right. I said, here, take it away, play with it. And two <laughs> days later, she came back with various drawings of, of, of what we do. Yeah. And she, she, I think when she got a spare moment, she sits in front of her iPad and produces illustrations. And I, I think they're very good indeed, actually. 
obviously they're illustrations of photographs, aren't they? So they're quite te they're quite technical in their in their look. They're not, yeah. uh, um, but they are essentially live photographs of surgery illustrated. Essentially, is what 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 the viewer will see. So I think we'll start off with uh, vaginoplasty because that's what is illustrated there. And just remind yeah. you when we finish talking about that that we I'd like you also to touch on um, aesthetic labiaplasty, which formerly was called cosmetic, but that's gone out the window for obvious reasons. It's not really a cosmetic procedure, is it? It's aesthetic labiaplasty and, and orchidectomy. So remind me afterwards that we need to just catch up on those two options as well. So obviously somebody needs to have an anesthetic. Do they come to the hospital uh, the morning of the surgery, the night before? What's the, what's the preoperative pl pl uh, plan for a patient before they're anesthetized? Uh, the majority of patients come in the night before because we have morning lists. If the patient is on an afternoon list, sometimes they come in the morning of surgery. Okay. Uh, the morning before the operation, so if they're having an operation at 8 o'clock in the morning, this is at 6 o'clock in the morning, a nurse comes in and gives them an enema. This is to get the rectum empty because the rectum and the prostate, is, we, have to get, we have to get into the space between those two organ, organs. This is a potential space, not an actual space, and a rectum full of feces bulging forward into the operative field is, uh, it's a risk that you don't want. You, want, you want. you don't want the space taken up, so the rectum needs to be empty so the patients get an enema. Yeah, so nice empty bowel to reduce the risk of bowel damage when you're cut, cutting to make that space. Absolutely, and they come, down, they come down to the operating theatre. From their point of view, they have a needle put in their arm, and uh, some white stuff's injected, and the next thing they know, they wake up in recovery, and everything between is a blank. Yeah, great, um, fantastic. <laughs> I, I, don't know, I don't know how many times you've been anaesthetized, Sophie, but um, I've been anaesthetized numerous times, quite a lot for rugby injuries, but there we are. Um, and I, I, find it a fa I still find it extraordinary how Remarkable. you've got a memory of, of, of going to sleep, and then, Someone saying, just breathe, cough the tube out, and you're waking up. And the operation may have taken five minutes, it may have taken five hours. You have absolutely no idea what happened in between. It's a marvel. Um, uh, yeah, I, one thing that the one important point of the part, the anesthetic that our anesthetists at Parkside use is they give what's called a caudal anesthetic, which is an injection through the base of the spine, which numbs the area between the legs, the scrotum. Um, and this reduces the amount of other anaesthetic agents which need to be given. Patients don't need a lot of morphine-like drugs to, to avoid them getting pain because the vast majority of the operative field is blocked completely anyway. That carries on typically for five or six hours after the operation, and it's surprising how few patients really need to use op opiate, in other words, morphine-like drugs post-operatively. Right. Um, it works very well. So once anaesthetized, the patients are brought and put onto the operating table in what's called the lithotomy position, um, which is uh, if people have seen American films of women giving birth, that's basically the lithotomy position with the legs uh, bent up uh, and the buttocks on the edge of the operating table so that the perineum, which is the piece, which is the part of the body between the legs, uh, is available for operation. Yep. Um, and uh, the first of the, of the slides just shows the beginning of the operation when an incision is made from the base of the penis right the way down to a centimetre or so above the anal margin. Having created that space, um, we, we uh, pack it with uh, some gauze swab. I, I personally soak the gauze swab in a dilute adrenaline solution because um, that tends to stop any further bleeding inside the new cavity. Okay. Um, we can move on then to the rest of the operation. Um, the first part of which is to remove the testes. Mm -hmm. um, these are approached through the upper, the upper part of the same incision. Um, it's important to remove the testes and their nerve and blood supply as far back up to the abdominal wall and ideally just within the abdominal wall as you can. Uh, the spermatic cord, as it's called, which attaches the testes to the, the insides, uh, is for some reason very prone to following what's called neuromas, where you have a little ball of sensitive nerve endings. And if this gets tethered to the subcutaneous tissues next, next to the new, new vagina, 
patients report pain and it's it, I've removed quite a few of these some from my own operations some from other people's operations so it's important to get that that dissected right the way back into the abdominal wall okay once those are removed the next stage is to prepare the skin tube um, the simplest skin tube is the penile skin tube and if a patient hasn't been circumcised they almost always have enough skin to produce a vaginal lining with just the penile skin tube. Uh, that, that the, the skin is divided uh, just below the glands penis, um, which is what other people, some people call it the helmet of the penis. But, um, and then uh, the penis can be inverted and the, if you like, the meat of the penis with the uh, erectile tissue and the urethra separated off from the skin tube. Once that's been done, uh, we can then uh, uh, remove, separate the urethra from the penis. That can be divided, um, and then it, the urethra and the rest of the penis are largely two separate organs at this point. Okay. Having done, having done that, the next stage is to make a clitoris. Fortunately, the nerve supply to the tip of the penis, to the sensitive tip, is separate to the erectile tissue of the penis itself. Uh, so you can actually raise a, a small piece of the sensitive tip of the penis on its own nerve and blood supply, which will remain sensitive and erectile um, once the operation is complete. Yeah. The, the vast majority of patients want a clitoris. There are one or two who don't. Some of our non-binary patients want, want uh, a, a, as flat a perineum as possible without, uh, without a clitoris. Okay. But the vast majority of patients do want a clitoris, and right. it's made by using this piece of tissue there. Yes. Okay. So so far, you've taken that you've created a space for the new vagina to go in. Uh, that's been done, and you've stripped away the skin of the penis, which is the bit that you're going to keep to make the skin line tube, and you've yep. also cut away the bulk of the flesh of the penis with some of the erectile tissue, uh, and shortened the P tube. Uh, leaving this this rather nice piece of uh, um, sort of nerve and blood supply, which just simply feeds the tip of the penis, which is the most sensitive part, in, with the aim of using that to create the clitoris. Yeah. Am I following you? You are, I think. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, we open out the urethra over a distance of about one and a half to two centimeters, typically. Uh, this is for a number of reasons, principally though that um, before we used to do this, we used just to bring the, just the tube to the, to the skin surface. And we had something like a 25 to 30% risk of the thing scarring down and uh, closing over and requiring revision. And that's, so the, now we, that's, where, the, that's the hole that where, where, where people pee through. Where people pee through, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm pleased to say in my own practice, Meatal stenosis is now comfortably under 1%. I think I've had two in the last six years. And that's where they get narrow. As they heal over, they scar and get tight. The skin heals, heals over. And, and actually what you, what you tend to find with these patients is that they complain of incontinence. Quite often they get sent to it. They, they've been to their GPs who say, you've probably got an infection. They've been treated with re re repeated doses of antibiotics. But the problem is that they're not emptying their bladders and urethras above properly and get this continuous dribbling and oh, constant right. of that. Right. Uh, and if I see a patient in clinic who I'm told um, has had repeated urinary tract infections, question one is, do you pee with any force at all? To which the answer is invariably, no, it's just a bit of a dribble. Right. Almost without looking at them, without examining them, I know that they're going to have a, a stenosis there, a narrowing of the skin, right. and they're going to need something to open it up. So you've changed your technique to, to basically reduce, vastly reduce that down. Then. That, that's reduced a lot. A, 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 a bonus of that is that the urethra, as, it, as we lay it forward, is a, is a pink, moist tissue which resembles quite closely the tissue between the vagina and the clitoris in cis women. The other, the other aspect is that the, the male urethra, and that is what we're operating on, is surrounded by erectile tissue. And as much of that needs to be removed as possible, 
Um, otherwise, when the patient becomes sexually aroused, it swells, with the result that the opening to the vagina gets narrowed. So that's removed and, uh, and sewn down. And then the, the penile skin tube can be inverted back into the cavity. Um, a space, a, a hole is cut in the, the, in the skin for the urethra and clitoris to be brought through and they're sutured into place and the cavity is put in. Okay. Uh, we, we remove excess skin from both sides. So the idea being that the patient then gets smooth labia majora. And usually, that it, usually it's necessary to produce a small clitoral hood. Sometimes it pretty much self forms. Sometimes uh, they need an extra incision to do that. Okay. So before we wake this person up, I just want to ask you what would be the difference for somebody having an aesthetic labiaplasty? Um, Obviously, this is, a, this is a brilliant option for some people. The operation is actually quite similar. Um, the, but you don't need to prepare a skin tube and you don't need to make a cavity. We do, we do actually make a little pit uh, behind where the scrotum is so that it looks as though there's the opening to a vagina. But it'll be half a centimetre to a centimetre maximum in depth. Right. But you're, and, and you're right, that the, the risk in terms of complications is much lower. There's no dissection up against the rectum. There's no chance for rectal injury, um, which is an important point. Uh, recovery from the operation is also a lot quicker. Patients are usually back about doing their normal day to, in normal day-to-day -day life a month to six weeks after this operation. Well, and sure. the other thing to be borne in mind, there's, there's, no, there's no maintenance. Yeah. If, you've, if you've had a vagina made, you're going to have to dilate. And you're going to have to be dilating for the rest of your life. I know. If you have a labiaplasty, there's no dilation to be done. And you um, mean by so dilation, you mean to keep the vagina o open, don't you? To keep yeah. it open and yeah. stretched and, yeah. Okay. Yes. I mean, if, 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 if you leave, a, if you put a, just put a vagina in and don't, don't use any dilators, the scar tissue that forms around anything like that will gradually shrink because that's what scar tissue does. And therefore, the vagina will get smaller and smaller and smaller until it becomes unusable for most things. The important, the important thing about labiaplasty is if you choose that, you will never have a vagina. You have to wrap your head around that. I mean, yeah. yes. But if you're happy with that, it's a good option. At least the skin has been lost, hasn't it, at that point? So the skin yeah. is gone. So, yeah, okay. All right, so let's wake, let's wake this person up then. So that, that's their surgery complete. And obviously they'll be, like you said, they'll, the next thing they'll know is they'll be asked to sort of, you know, breathe, breathe, keep breathing, nice deep breaths, cough out the tube, that sort of thing. Um, let's, take, let's take them back to the ward then. Um, for someone who's had a vaginoplasty surgery, what, what's, what sort of length of time are they expected to be, to be in hospital for? Um, they'll be in hospital for another, for another six days at the moment. Um, on arrival back to the ward, they'll be, they'll have this rather large, very tight, nappy type bandage, um, which unfortunately quite a lot of patients find uncomfortable. It's putting pressure on, it's reducing the risk of bleeding, particularly from the urethra, re reducing the risk of hematomas, blood clots under the skin. Um, I personally get those off the day after. I know Tina likes to leave one a little longer than I do. There's slight variations, but it's not huge. Okay. Um, and I, I, get, I personally get the patients out of bed as soon as I can because I'd far rather they were walking around the, their rooms, walking around the ward, than lying in bed growing DVTs. Yeah. So the six days are really getting up and about. I suspect a lot of the care then comes from your brilliant nursing team who make sure that their, yeah. you know, their pain is under control, changing the, the, the dressings, checking in on everything. And also I understand that, that, that patients also learn how to, um, you know, as the days go a little bit longer, they, they learn a little bit how to sort of change the pack and, and learn how to dilate very gently, just starting people off with that. Well, the, the pack comes out five days after the operation right. and the urethral catheters, that's the tube that goes into the bladder that drains the bladder. So they both come out on day five. and. As, the, as soon as the pack's out, the patient is shown how to put a dilator in instead. Uh, yeah, okay. We use two dilators of approximately 2.5 and 3 centimetre diameter. Um, and the patient is encouraged to start dilating three times a day. 
yeah. they spend 24 hours in hospital from removal of the packs or going home. So oh, they, yeah. they really should have got the hang of it by then. We also, it also means that we know they're passing urine properly and um, then they go home the following day. Super. And then I suppose it's just the healing, isn't it? It's the healing um, that needs to take place then over the coming weeks and months. Um, what's the what's the average healing times both with the vaginoplasty and the and the aesthetic labiaplasty? I mean, most people are essentially healed probably within about two to three weeks. Yeah. With a few gaps here and there, and a bit of ooze from here and there. When we see patients in clinic at about eight weeks, the vast majority of patients are completely healed by that stage. Yeah. They may have granulation tissue where there's been a small gap and the granulation tissue pouts through, which we need to treat because otherwise it doesn't heal up and they have this discharge forever. Right. And that's um, for everyone else to understand that granulation <laughs> tissue is, 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 is basically where the skin hasn't joined. So it's the stuff under, it's the flesh under the skin slightly pokes through, is it? And it, 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 it it's a bit more than that. It's actually, it's actually the body's natural, natural part of natural healing. Yeah. The, uh, the, um, if you've got a gap between two pieces of tissue, the body creates granulation tissue yeah. to fill the gap. What's meant to happen is once the gap's filled, the skin grows over the top, the granulation tissue is replaced by scar tissue. Yeah. Particularly in this area, for reasons we don't know, it quite often grows through the gap, pouts, or pouts out and stops the skin healing. And so what, what we do with that is remove it either by cutting it off or using silver nitrate on it which kills it back with the hope that the skin will then grow over it. And that can be anywhere where you've cut and joined two things together. So it could be inside the vagina, it could be it where... It can be right at the top of the vagina, it can be at the back of the skin tube. Anywhere. Back of the skin tube is quite common. Okay. But it can also happen for, for people who've had the, the aesthetic labiaplasty as well, where you've cut... It, you... it can, yes, because there, there can be gaps in, in between in the, in the skin there. And, and if, if a patient gets a hematoma underneath one of the, one of the labia, which probably happens in about 5% of cases. That's a blood clot that forms afterwards. Mm. Um, that, that will burst its way through the skin and create literally a bloody mess for them, typically three or four days after they've gone home. And it will gradually heal up. Well, it won't gradually, it's a strange business. It does nothing for about a week or so. And the patient's getting more and more anxious, saying, phoning up saying, I know Mr. Beringer says this is going to heal, but it's looking exactly the same as it did three days ago. Right. And the nurses are saying, yes, yes, yes. And by the time we get to day seven, they're saying, Mr. Baring has needed, he quite clearly knows nothing. And day eight, nine, ten, it suddenly closes. And they say, oh, he was right all along. Right. <laughs> yes. I mean, and I think you've led me on to, a, you know, the next point, I suppose, or the next thing I'd like to discuss, which is when it doesn't quite go right. Obviously, there are some things that you just can't get, you know, you can't escape. If you're cutting the body, you're going to have the risk of you know healing tissue poking through potentially or like you said some of these other things a bit of bit of leakage of blood in you know behind the skin to cause a hematoma that comes with a lot of surgery that comes with you know, uh, the only surgeon who doesn't get complications is the one who's retired yes indeed so but talk to me about some of the things that people need to be mindful of going into this particular type of surgery well the one that worries us most is a fistula which is where we make a hole in the rectum obviously not intentionally um, and it then breaks down and leaks into the new vagina. It yeah. is a bit of a disaster when it happens. In my hands, it's about half a percent, so one in 200. Okay. And I think I'm more or less in line with most of the rest of the country on that one. Um, most of the published series from Europe are around one, and one to one to one and a half percent. The problem is, of course, we talk about it to all the patients and as, a, as, a, as a risk because it is so serious. And they're all convinced they've got one for a while. Um, and that's partly because they've always got a bit of old blood and stuff around, which gets infected with the bacteria of the area and comes out with a very pooey smell, but it's all liquid and so on. Yeah, okay. A fist, with a fistula, they, they occur typically between 7 and 12 12 days after the operation, so sadly after the patient's gone home. Right. And the patient starts part, might start passing wind through the vagina, although that isn't an absolute certain sign, but they start passing obvious lumps of feces. 
Right. That's the first chill alert. We know that, you know, it doesn't, I'm so fortunate, it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, that's what happens. The patients are usually at home by that stage. And to be honest, the best thing they can do is go to the local casualty department, get themselves admitted. Usually the local colorectal surgeon will, will bring out a colostomy, a bag, which they're going to need if they've got that. Um, allow that because, to heal up and settle down. Some about half of them will heal without intervention if you just do a colostomy. The other half you get left with the residual hole. Well, fortunately, it's rare, but of course, if it was 20 patients a year, we'd really know what to do about it. Yes, I mean, in some ways, it's a good thing that it is so so infrequent, but then of course, it means that you, you know, like you said, it's you're having to adjust each time you see someone with it and work out what. Yeah. Might best way to do it when, when you go to international surgical meetings of people who do these operations it's one of the things we discuss what do you do with this and yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's no consensus because none of us none of us have a 100 percent. i do this it always gets better okay. because it, there's, it's not like that and i think you know that's probably the the the, the, the one that's the uh, the one that's probably the most unpleasant and difficult to deal with and then yeah. some other things that can happen i suppose things like prolapse of the vagina well prolapse, prolapse of the vagina when i took this on was was running at 10 to 15 percent um i've had two in the last six years so it's really come right down really rare. Okay. i think this is partly the mobilization it's partly changing the packing there's all types of things that have, have I've probably got a little better at doing the operation in the last 20 years, to be fair, as well. A little. Had some practice. Um, okay. And when, you, and when you do repair the prolapses, it's not painful anymore. And does that need a second anaesthetic, or is that something that they have done? Uh, uh, no, that's, that, that's, that's, that's another operation. Yes. Okay. Oh, gosh. Okay. So, well, luckily, it doesn't happen too commonly then. And, you know... No. What I tend to say to people is that the body roughly heals in six weeks fully. So scar tissue is laid down and, 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 and secure in about six weeks. And, and obviously then with the, uh, what we call a urethral stricture, so where the P-tube does scar over a bit, again, is it just a simple case of stretching that out? Um, uh, you, can, you can use dilators and stretch it, and then you can encourage the patient to pass a cast to themselves. So, they, so in addition to doing a dilation, they have to put a catheter into the bladder. Um, I tend actually to recommend a surgical operation to open the, the, the urethra up on a permanent basis. It seems to be very effective. I've only ever had one or two of them, I think, have ever required a second, a second go at it. Mm. So it seems to be very effective what we do when, when we've got those stenoses. So I, 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 tend, I tend to do what's what I call a meatoplasty. As I said, I haven't done many yeah. because I'm pleased to say we don't get many. No, because you've changed, the technique is now improved and you get a good result from the beginning, which is, which is great. Okay, I mean, I can't think of much else off the top of my head. Was there anything else that you wanted to add to in terms of complications and that sort of thing or? or no, I don't think so. I think, I mean, I suppose. I suppose it's things like loss of skin flaps. Um, the, clitoral, the clitoral tissue is on a very long pedicle. It's 15 or 16 centimetres long. That isn't 100% reliable. 2% of patients, the clitoris significantly shrinks or even completely disappears. The interesting thing is, well, that, that never needs any intervention. You can't, unfortunately, redo the clitoris. The tissue's gone. But the interesting thing is that the, the, the sensation tends to be preserved. Yeah, I think what we do when we talk to people, we talk about the risk of, of sens sensation loss, but of course also of tissue loss. So with everything that you cut and move somewhere else, there is always a chance that the blood supply won't regrow in. And that's the same for any, any area of surgery where you're, yeah. you're grafting a piece onto another, another area. Okay, yes. I mean, loss, loss, loss of a certain amount of vaginal depth, I think is probably universal in that most patients get 15 16 17 centimeters in hospital and typically lose a centimeter over the first two or three weeks right um, and i think that's almost universal um, 
but if you lose a, if you if you have a if some of the, the skin of the vagina completely loses its blood supply and goes black of course you'll lose quite a lot more than that in the end yeah that's that's fortunately quite rare i mean i've, I've had one patient with almost complete loss of vaginal skin in the last 20 years yeah so that complete loss of it is very rare okay partial loss of it with a certain amount of loss of depth a bit more common i can't give you a number though yeah and I'm, I'm i'm focusing deliberately on what can go wrong because i think it's it's really helpful for people to go in with the, you know the full expectation understanding of everything we already know and we don't even need to describe the, the positives to having this surgery you know that that, I mean, I could go on all, all day and I'm sure pa patients can. So we don't need to, you know, linger on, on what's, what's um, so brilliant about this surgery um, for so many people in so many ways. Just before we finish, I just wanted to quickly ask you about orchidectomy. Is that still something that you are able to, to offer in, in the NHS or is that shifting? No, orchidectomy is still done on the NHS. Um, there's a bit of pressure come on to say... This is not specialist. It doesn't need to be done in specialist centres. You don't need to go to, to London or Hove to have your orchidectomy. And back in the day when I started training, there was probably true that most jobbing urologists would do a, proper, do a decent orchidectomy. That's actually changed because of the same drugs that, we, that the patients are now using, the Decapeptil or Zolodex or Prostat that they're using. Because the indication for orchidectomy for most of us when I was a urological trainee was to treat prostate cancer. And these drugs came in to suppress testosterone, which helped treat prostate cancer. Right. And all of a sudden, from doing a couple of orchidectomies a month in most, in most urology departments, we were down to doing one in a blue moon. People, people need to be aware that... that they will lose some scrotal skin in terms of over time, which is another reason why, why I'd like it if it stayed uh, uh, with uh, the specialist gender surgeons, because when I see somebody who's referred for an orchidectomy, I can assess, well, actually, they've got enough penile skin. If they were to change their minds or decide, yeah, actually, vaginoplasty is for me, and that's what I want, I can say to them, yes, that's going to be possible, don't worry, or, hmm. If there's any chance of that, you need to be careful about having an orchidectomy. Why don't you think about it a bit longer? Okay, James, I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for giving up your time. Um, I, I've learned absolutely loads, and I'm sure um, people watching it will have as well. So thank you so much. Um, it's been an absolute delight. I am going to, as part of this film, I'm going to be talking to people who have lived experience of the surgery. Um, two, two people who I'm hoping to talk to were former patients of yours. So um, let's see what they have to say. And it's, oh, uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's also, you know, I think, I think what's really going to be interesting is that they're going to talk about them. Um, you know, one lady has ha had surgery a year ago and another 10. So I think it's really important for us all to remember that this is surgery that's life-changing, almost always for the best. And, and, and it's something that people, you know, have for the rest of their lives. So I think it's really important to think about what's life like yeah. after a year or so and what's life like after 10 or 20 years, you know? Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I'll no doubt see you at some point soon, probably on Zoom somewhere. <laughs> <laughs>